Welcome everybody to our machine learning seminar. This is the first seminar in the new academic year 2023-24. Um, uh, we'll have a pleasure to have a, a lecture, the presentation from uh, Juan Pablo Bortaga Rai from uh, Universitat de la Republica from Montevideo, Uruguay, um, who will present uh, his uh, topic on, uh, which is, I mean, the title is already present on the screen, so I will not read it. Um, please, uh, Juan Pablo, the virtual floor is, is yours. Please go ahead. Thank you, Jacob, for the, for the introduction, and also thank you for the, for the kind invitation. Uh, I didn't know this was the first one in the year, so now I feel a little more pressure. Um, so this is um, some joint work uh, with uh, Francisco Barceche, who was a postdoc. Uh, he actually was a postdoc in Uruguay uh, during 2020. So he actually never came to Uruguay during that year while he was a postdoc. But uh, this is part of uh, uh, a project we, we started uh, then. And uh, OK, so it's about uh, uh, a least squares method, uh, first order. Uh, I will explain a little bit what I mean by that. And uh, it's for treating, uh, for the moment, uh, elliptic PDEs, okay, and uh, by using uh, neural networks. So, um, my, my model problem would be quite lax, uh, let me say. Um, so, I have a nice or nice enough domain, uh, bounded domain in RD, and uh, I will consider that the, the boundary is split into two parts. Uh, uh, one I call the, referred to as the Dirichlet part and the other one the Neumann part. Uh, okay, so I just assume that the Dirichlet part has positive measure so that uh, in any case I can guarantee this problem is well posed. And so I have a, an elliptic problem. Um, so uh, my matrix here, my diffusivity is just some positive definite, uh, uniformly positive definite matrix field and I may or may not have a, a first or zero order term here B okay so this can accommodate say I know stationary reaction diffusion equations uh, and um, I'm particularly in, particularly interested in also having some Neumann some Neumann uh, boundary condition okay so the let me just start first with the formulation of the problem uh the mathematical formulation um so what i'll do is to switch the writing of the system and moving to a first order writing so i'll introduce a flux p and so i just impose that uh, phi is a times gradient of u in omega and i write my pde in terms of both phi and u okay so now instead of having a second order equation, I have two first order equations, okay? And the boundary conditions, of course, for you, I have nothing to do, but for phi, I can write it also as a, as a now, as an outward Dirichlet, say, boundary condition for, for the flux, right? So uh, it's still the Neumann condition, but written slightly differently. And uh, my goal is to find solutions, okay, that uh, will be both u and phi. So I, I will seek the, the, phi, the field uh, u, but also it's flux phi. And then I have to pose this problem in some good okay, functional space. This is not central for the talk, but uh, I will just consider uh, an admissible class of functions that are h1 times h div. So I want u to have first order square, square integral derivatives and phi to have um, square interval divergence, okay? And then I also need to impose my boundary conditions. I will incorporate, incorporate them in my admissible class. And of course, uh, if a pair u phi satisfies this PDE here, then this red functional, this uh, loss function will be zero, okay? And of course, this loss functional is not negative, and this is a typical least squares formulation for this problem, right? So I will switch from the PDE to a least squares problem. 
uh, for both you and FIFA. And uh, of course, the goal is just to find this minimizer. And this is a well-posed problem mathematically. Uh, there's nothing special with this formulation. Um, something that is interest, interesting, and I will come back to this later, is that this problem is elliptic. Okay, so I will explain a little bit what I mean, but in particular, this gives us well potentness, but well potentness is essentially for free, I mean, uh, in this problem. Because we already know that the PDE has, uh, has good properties, so to say. Okay, so this is a machine learning seminar, so where does the machine learning enter in this formulation? Uh, this way. So the idea is to, to consider some discretization, so to say, uh, of this space A, um, this admissible class by using neural networks, and then to try to compute this least squares functional L by Monte Carlo integration, okay? And um, I will, um, there, there let's say, um, Oh, sorry, I, I, this classification is in the wrong item. So, uh, in principle, the, the way to impose boundary conditions could be, um, or a natural way, so to say, would be just to add some penalization terms. Say, for example, for the Dirichlet data to add an L2 discrepancy on the, on the boundary. Um, I will not do so. I would rather uh, impose boundary conditions strongly. I will come back to this in a second. This will require an extra step in my formulation, in my, my method. Um, but once I have somehow created a space of neural network functions uh, that already incorporate boundary conditions, okay, I can try to minimize uh, my, my loss function. Okay, so the, the, conceptually, this is very simple. Uh, I'm not saying I'm inventing the wheel whatsoever. Okay, so this is a very natural idea. Um, but just let me let me emphasize why I want a first order formulation as opposed to a second order formulation. Okay, so first of all, I I I'd rather avoid uh, computing second derivatives. First of all, because of of efficiency, but. Uh, mostly because I come from finite elements and uh, I am very happy with my piecewise linear functions and uh, therefore for me real use feel like a very natural activation functions and using second derivatives with real use could be a little bit uh, could bring in some technical difficulties and of course the second derivative of piecewise linear function would be a measure so not very uh, friendly with our formulation. So I want to, to use values, uh, therefore I, I still, I, I would rather go with a first order formulation. Then um, if, if our PDE has uh, poor regularity properties, mainly due to the geometry being rough or you know, the coefficients being also rough, uh, of course the solution would be uh, not so regular and uh, well, I, with this first order formulation, I think uh, we, we should have better capability to represent these lower solutions. And then if I have Neumann conditions, and um, if I have a nice way to enforce them strongly um, in my method, then it's, it's better to keep the first order formulation. Okay? So I, this is roughly why I want this first order uh, formulation. Of course, this has a lot of history. Let me just throw in some names, but mostly I will. I want to say the background on which topics uh, are like uh, give us the, the the road to to this method. So, of course, neural networks are not new whatsoever. The in particular, their approximation capabilities have been studied for quite some time already, uh, since almost forty years now. Um, we're still, in my opinion, a little bit uh, far from optimal in terms of understanding how well they approximate. Um, first order formulations for elliptic PDE by using finite elements is also something well established already. Um, so also 40 years old, so to say. Um, of course, 
And in recent years, there has been a lot of interest in, in neural networks. And in particular, there have been a lot of methods recently for dealing with uh, PDE. And um, okay, in particular of least squares types or I would say with variation of flavor. And um, many times the, the approach in, this, in these methods consists in using some penalization term to enforce the boundary conditions. But okay, more recently we also, we actually, this, this idea of using a, a pre-training step to, to enforce boundary conditions comes from, from these this works, in particular the one by Berg and Nistrom. And even more recently, there have been some methods that uh, have a lot of resemblance with what we're doing because, I mean, the ideas were already mature enough. So I'm not saying the method is a novelty. Uh, I would say that the novelty in, of my talk comes from the analysis of the method. Um, but so there, like in around 2020, 2021, there, there was a lot of uh, methods appearing uh, with first order uh, least squares formulations for PDE by using neural networks. Um, there are some slight differences with what we propose, in particular, some of them using structure grids. So that doesn't give you uh, much flexibility in terms of uh, space dimension. Um, other methods using penalization terms. So there's all variants of, of, of the method I'm advocating, okay? But my main point is not uh, that the method I'm presenting is new or, or too original, so to say, but uh, the question of uh, what can we say about the solution we obtain? So in practice, all methods perform very nicely. Uh, we can all come up with some methods with good uh, results in practice, or we can sell our results as very good. Um, but uh, what can we say about how close what we see is from the actual PD solution? Okay, and in what sense? Like uh, to to give some more precise meaning to to the conversions question. So let me let me just start by briefly commenting on, on how we impose boundary conditions, and this requires a, a pre-training step. So let's assume I have both. Dirichlet and Neumann conditions uh, that would require me to 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 pre-train five uh, functions, um, which should be cheaper than uh, the training of the PD solution. And uh, so D stands for distance, of course, distance to a Dirichlet or Neumann boundary. G would be some kind of lifting of the data boundary data, and N would be a lifting of the normal field. So. Um, if, for example, I want to create uh, some uh, or to train this, this distance to the Dirichlet boundary function, well, what I do is to sample some points on the boundary, sample some points um, in, in the interior of the domain, and then I will just train, uh, I will just say compute by, by, by a searching algorithm, uh, the list of these distances. This will be my, my proxy for the distance between my point in the domain to the boundary. And then once I have computed that, I can train my Dirichlet distance by this way. So I'm essentially penalizing here the discrepancy with respect to uh, this approximate distance I have. And I'm also penalizing, of course, that uh, D is non-zero on the boundary of the domain. So the first term wants D to be similar to what I computed as the distance inside in the training points. And the second term wants this function D to vanish on the boundary. And the, the, the technique for the rest of the functions is similar in flavor, so to say. Um, once I have uh, these pre-trained uh, auxiliary functions, um, I will consider my neural network functions in this way. So uh, I, I will actually not uh, train for u and phi, but for v and c, 
which uh, then will be related to my functions u and phi in this way. So um, u is distance, the Dirichlet distance times v plus the lifting of the Dirichlet data. So this way v can be whatever on the boundary, then dd will kill that part on the boundary and gd will take care of the Dirichlet condition. And the same with the, with the flux uh, function. So this guy C can be whatever on the boundary. The magic is that once you do this little transformation here, you uh, ensure that uh, the normal the, the normal component of phi coincides with Gn on the Neumann boundary. So this will be my 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 approximation class, so to say. This will be the kind of functions I will use to approximate my PD solution. And then the method is straightforward uh, the implementation in the sense that I have this least squares functional. I will sample points inside omega at random, probably with a uniform probability distribution. I don't know. And then just compute this loss term, this loss function, sorry, which for future reference, I will call G1 and G2, the two components in this loss function. And then, of course, I will try to minimize this, this ln. Okay, so for example, um, let's say I have a problem in, in RD, uh, a very simple problem, but I mentioned maybe high. So I have a Laplace problem with this right-hand side here and both Dirichlet and Neumann condition. This is all uh, contrived so that I know the solution. Um, but uh, we see uh, good results still with by using fairly small uh, networks, so 18 neurons per layer, and uh, we use three layers for the auxiliary functions here. Uh, we could have used less actually, and uh, five layers for 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 uh, the PD solution with only 25 neurons per layer. So not that many parameters actually. And uh, so what we do is at each iteration, we can uh, we can change the batch. So we actually, uh, in principle, by doing some, okay, uh, gradient descent uh, or stochastic gradient descent, we can even change the, the, the set of points we sample, the batch. And uh, then in practice, it is like taking a huge batch or you can also consider uh, doing some repetition. There are variants we, we can play here, um, but we see uh, nice results. So I'm, I'm showing you just uh, a slice of the, of the solution. And uh, okay, the last function is decreasing, of course, and then we can also compute some L2 discrepancy between our, our neural network solution and the PD solution. We can even treat, I don't know, uh, singularly perturbed problems. So in this problem, uh, this problem is elliptic, but uh, we have this epsilon term here that uh, will be small. Uh, so this, this PD solution will, will have a strong, sharp boundary layer uh, near corner of my domain. And this is the, this is the, neural network solution and uh, we still observe good behavior with this method. Okay, so the, the method is, is fine in, in the sense that uh, it works as we expect. Uh, and, even, and even we can say a little bit more because the, the problem and the formulation we have is elliptic. And by that, I mean that if I take the, say the homogeneous counterpart, so if I didn't have an F, uh, I have this L function here in the middle. Well, these two terms are comparable when added with the, H, with the natural uh, norm in my problem. So with the H1 times HD of norm. And this is telling me already that uh, what, for whatever function I have, um, if I compute the exact loss function, the least squares function on my UMVM, this, is related to the to the error in this problem norm. So actually by computing the loss function, I can 
say something about the error. This is for free because of electricity. Okay, but uh, once you have that, and once you already, by some reason, know that your neural network space or whatever your set is able to approximate the PD solution, that will give you convergence. Okay, the catch is that we cannot compute the 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 least squares function exactly. We are instead doing some Monte Carlo integration. So we are doing some approximation of that. And it's even more uh, than that because usually we cannot even compute uh, the minimizers. Okay, so we're doing some grading descent algorithm and we stop it, I don't know, with, uh, uh, without certainty that we are actually computing the minimizer on our neural network space. So this analysis here is very nice but it's not enough, okay, for in practice to guarantee that our method is actually producing some solutions. So the question as a mathematician for me is, what can we say about the conversions of this method? Okay, and, uh, and, and of these related methods in general, okay? And um, the way, the way we, we found to phrase conversions here uh, has to do with what's known as gamma conversions, which comes from uh, the mathematical community in, in calculus of variations. And it has to do with the conversions of minimization problems. Okay, so let me just briefly say what, what I mean by gamma conversions. Um, you essentially need some sequence of functionals. Say, think of your loss functionals um that have to have a couple properties they have to be lower uh, stable with respect to lower uh, continuity so um, for every sequence approaching any point you need to have that your uh, the limit uh, of your functionals lies above the the value of of the limit in that point and once you have that stability you also need to have some recovery sequence from from below Okay, and uh, if you have these two conditions um, and you have some kind of compactness, uh, typically it's phrased in terms of equi equicorsiveness, which means that uh, roughly uh, there's some compact set in which I can pose my problem safely, I have conversions of minimum problems. Okay, so this is like, a, this is known as the fundamental theorem of, of gamma conversions. Um, and in particular, gives us conversions of minimizers. Okay, so my my goal is roughly this: that uh, if if I have some compactness, if for some reason I can pose my problems in some uh, compact set, um, then as soon as I con can compute uh, some sequence of quasi minimizers, any cluster point of my sequence would be a minimizer of my loss function. In particular, I already know that my loss function has a unique minimizer, it's the PDE solution. So as long as I, as I can compute, uh, uh, I, I, I call them almost minimizers or quasi-minimizers, uh, the, the limit, that sequence has to have a limit and the limit has to be the PDE solution. And the limit here means in the, in the distance defined in the metric space X, which here would be H1 times H2. Um, okay, so this is like a checklist of, of things I have to, to check, uh, the limb inf and the limb sup. I will not uh, delve into details here. Um, essentially the limb sup or recovery sequence comes almost for free because it has to do with the, with the strong law of large numbers. I'm here, I'm sampling points. So I know that if I sample enough, I will recover uh, almost surely I will recover my loss functional for every set of parameters I take, then that means that the recovery sequence can be taken trivially as a constant sequence. This is very simple, actually. The LIMINF is a little bit more complicated to prove. It requires some measure theory uh, results. But as long as you have some continuity of your uh, parameter to neural network function map, and some control in the summons, so on your PDE terms, uh, you can you can do it. And 
What I find most, most interesting is the equicursivity, okay? Because equicursivity is compactness and mathematicians need compactness. Otherwise, we cannot say anything meaningful. And in terms of neural networks, that means that your parameters cannot be too large. And that means regularization, okay? So for the moment, I will need to assume that uh, the optimal for, for any, um, uh, say, neural network configuration architecture, I will need to assume that the optimal set of parameters, uh, or there is some optimal set of parameters inside some huge ball. Okay. And, and I want to discuss this a little bit later. So what we can prove is actually that uh, under some general assumptions, as long as we can um, minimize or quasi-minimize uh, our Monte Carlo loss functional on the, on the neural network space, we can expect conversions in H1 times H2. Okay, so there's a lot of words here, but uh, I have the, my loss functional, my uh, Monte Carlo approximation to it. Um, let's assume that for every neural network configuration uh, and every huge ball, I can find some sequence of parameters that uh, as n goes to infinity, uh, as, as long as I, I take enough sampling points, I will approximate the, the, the minimum of my loss function. Then what I can say is that almost surely I will have conversions in H1 times HD, roughly. Okay, so the wording is a little bit tricky here, but essentially what I'm saying is that for any tolerance epsilon, um, I can take enough, a rich enough uh, space, a neural network space or neural network set. I don't, know what, I don't like the word space here. It's something, um, but I can take a, a, a huge space or a big enough space and enough sampling points so that uh, what I can compute, if I can compute some quasi minimizer uh, will be sufficiently close to the PD solution. And this type of results, uh, we hadn't seen them before. And uh, they, they do not only uh, this result doesn't only apply to our method, it also applies to some related method. And after, after we, we, we proved our result for our method, we started thinking on uh, what are the, the key or what's the core of, of the proof, so what we actually need. And uh, what we need is roughly the stability of the, of the, of the parameter to a neural network solution map. Um, we need that uh, once we have conversions in the um, in the natural norm, in the least squares norm, um, we can convert that into uh, a subsequence conversion pointwise. Um, we need some control on the PDE terms, and of course we need to have a well posed problem. Okay, these these four ingredients uh, we can. We can prove them under very general assumptions for our problem. And finally, what we need is also some approximability property. So we actually need that the PD solution can be approximated by the neural network functions. Okay. And this last one is actually very tricky. Um, this last one, uh, I'm not entirely satisfied. Uh, we, we had to, well, we had to assume some regularity properties on the solution of the PDE. And this is actually the one that I think we have more room for improvement and for understanding the problem. Now, let me, let me just compare for a second this, our approach with some related methods. Um, so I was saying that our proof applies also for, for our methods. And uh, I'm just comparing with two well-established uh, methods in the literature. Um, the deep galerting and the deep bridge method, um, which for a very simple PDE as the homogeneous Dirichlet problem, um, they will suggest to take uh, functionals in this way. So the deep galerting method is based on a uh, least squares formulation, uh, but um, in second order. 
and the deep reads method is, uh, is based on just the variational formulation of the problem. And let's just, let's say we assume that uh, both methods, or actually both methods, uh, advocate for uh, drawing points at random from omega to compute an approximation of the loss functional. And let's assume that uh, we impose a strong, uh, strongly the, the Dirichlet boundary condition. Okay, this is is not fundamental to the methods, but helps for our comparison. Then we can fit these both methods in our analysis, and actually we could prove conversions in almost L2 norm for the deep galeric methods and in uh, solid norm for the deep reads method. Okay, so we can actually extend our, our framework to uh, problems based on least squares or variational formulations. Uh, for this problem, or, or really the problem. Now, let me just finish by, by um, with some words about uh, regularization, okay? Because this is something that happened to us uh, while running experiments. So at some point we, okay, we were very happy, we had the method, we had the analysis, so on. And, uh, okay, let's start right, running experiments. And uh, we tried a few experiments in which we got a very uh, non-meaningful uh, solutions. And uh, it took us quite some time to understand that what was going on there was that uh, we were taking uh, too many parameters. Somehow we were over overfitting the data, so to say. Um, and, and it has to do with the need for regularization. So we actually, we actually need to assume uh, the equicorsiveness to avoid uh, our neural networks to approximate some non-relevant functions. So let me, let me just show you a very stupid example in 1D. So I'm just writing the, um, the uh, second derivative of u equals zero with homogy uh, with Dirichlet conditions zero on one end one on one end written in first order form. This is straightforward. Uh, so my least squares functional is this way, and of course the PD solution here is just u of x equal x. Straightforward to check, and phi of x phi is the derivative of u has to be one. Straightforward. So very stupid example. Um, but now I consider this type of functions. So for some small delta, I just consider uh, u delta to be a regularization of, of a step function with, with some layer of width to delta. Okay, and phi delta is the, the derivative of u delta. And of course, as delta goes to zero, um, this will give us a non-meaningful um, a non-meaningful um, solution. But interestingly enough, we would have um, the following. So, oh no, this is not zero actually, sorry. So of course, phi delta is the derivative of phi delta almost everywhere, uh, not even in the weak sense, in the distribu distributional sense. Sorry, this is not correct. This loss function should be small, but not that small. But the important part here is that uh, phi delta is not an admissible. So this pair is not admissible, roughly because phi delta is, has jumps. And if phi delta has jumps, it's not in the solo space. So this can can seem like a mathematician's uh, of mathematician's interest only, but I think it's relevant in practice because what happens then is that if you don't sample enough, so if you just sample endpoints and none of these points uh, lies in this small layer, then you will observe zero on your uh, Monte Carlo uh, function. So if you don't sample enough, then your neural network may want to approximate this type of step functions. Okay, so of course, to produce these functions with large gradients or with jumps, the parameters have to be large. Okay, so um, somehow regularization is throwing away this type of non-meaningful, almost everywhere solutions. Okay, so regularization is related to the regularity of the PDE solution. 
Okay, so parameter regularization. So we need to keep our parameters uh, small enough. So not even small enough, it's not far enough, not too large. Okay, and, and we don't know, uh, it's still not clear to us how to do so. Okay, so how to regularize correctly. Um, so far, we, we've been trying to do some, some uh, rough penalization, but it's not clear to us how to, how to avoid the practice. Okay, so let me just uh, wrap up. Um, I discussed the first order least squares formulation for, uh, based on deep learning for a second order elliptic PVE um, with a strong imposition of, of boundary conditions. Um, we are proposing a Monte Carlo integration method, of course, because we care about high dimensional problem, uh, problems, but this uh, comes with uh, some uh, uncertainty in the computation of the loss functional. But, uh, and so the way we can, we can actually recover convergence is in this language of, uh, or this framework of gamma convergence. Um, and we recover convergence as long as uh, the set of parameters or collocation points is rich enough. And if we have some regularization, will give us the almost short convergence of our minimizers to us, towards the PD solution. And this framework applies also to to some other methods. Um, we are actually, we're currently um, working on, on, on some different problems um, related to this one, in particular variational inequalities, type of obstacle problems, which I find interesting because there, there's also some free boundary we would need to approximate, and it's not so clear how to do so in this, in this setting. And another problem that I find interesting and we're thinking of is uh, how to compare or um, how to compare CS yes, in, this, in this framework, uh, time stepping methods, say, right, if I have a parabolic problem, how to compare uh, using at each step some elliptic PD and then move forward in time as opposed to uh, space time L2 uh, least squares formulation. So um, it's not clear to me which one is more convenient or when one would be more convenient than the other. Um, my wish list for, for this topic uh, would be to get some convergence rates, uh, in particular to understand the interplay between a, a solution regularity and how well one can approximate them by neural network functions. If we had that, we could uh, obtain uh, convergence rates in terms of, of uh, parameters, so to say. And then something something else that I find interesting and I think would be very beneficial to have is uh, some good way to incorporate adaptivity. Say, if I know my solution uh, is poorer in some region of the boundary, or of the domain, sorry, if there's some way to incorporate that into my method so as to uh, enhance the, the convergence. Um, at some point, I thought that uh, doing some non-uniform sampling in my in my collocation points would be would be good for this, but that actually doesn't work. So uh, I think it was a too naive uh, and too wishful from my side. But uh, I, I put this question here in my in my wish list. And okay, with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Juan Pablo, for a very uh very let's say deep uh, mathematically deep uh, presentation uh for me it was uh, super interesting to see and thoughtful and uh, so let me open the discussion part um, as usual whoever wants to ask question leave a comment uh, please do so by switching your microphone or, or just uh, raising hand and then i will uh, let you ask a question you can also use a comment chat box if you wish to. I have several questions, but I, I would prefer somebody else to take a lead. Okay, so maybe <laughs> let me start. Uh, so, uh, 
well, maybe let me start with, start with one comment to your uh, motivation behind uh, not using second derivatives uh, uh, and uh, for co converting the problem to the one that is using only first gradients. Uh, these are the gradients with respect to the um, spatial coordinates. Spatial, problem. yes. So, uh, so, and the spatial coordinates, I believe, are the inputs to your neural network, if I am yes. correct. Yes. So when you are using uh, ReLU activation functions, which are, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, zero and linear functions, then computing a first deriva derivative already gives you uh, at, at most a constant function. So the second mm -hmm. derivative would be would be always zero. Yeah. If you, if you compute the derivative, so gradients, just using uh, differentiation through the network, not the yes. finite difference. Yes, so, yes, 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 exactly. So, but so maybe this is another reason not to use no, yeah, yeah, derivative exactly. so I, I, combination I with to ReLU. Use, mm -hmm. Yeah, because um, I, I mean, my motivation to consider ReLU's is also that I find them the ones that uh, we are closer to understanding their their approximation capabilities. Mm -hmm. So, if I want to say something meaningful, I would start by considering ReLU's, and uh, then, of course, yes, the method becomes absolutely meaningless. A second order formulation by using radius. Right. So, uh, so maybe a, a bit more uh, general questions. Question is, uh, why do you use this multi-layer neural network in your case? Uh, because uh, the let's say yes, uh, general we... approximation theorem says that a single latent yes exactly so should be I, enough I that's something yes that's something I, I i didn't discuss uh kind of on, on purpose but uh, actually if i want to um have so let me see this hypothesis list so this last hypothesis i actually kind of assuming i have a single layer so if i want to say um something or if I want to give some conditions in which I know this hypothesis holds, I need to assume I have a single layer uh, neural network. Okay. Yeah. Yes. This is good. Um, but mm -hmm. I mean, of course, yes. Uh, then the question is, uh, in practice, still deep networks will perform better. So uh, this is one of these things in which um, I, I think uh, we are lacking understanding of the problem or, or, or of the tool. Um, because um, actually taking um, the, the, the approximation class becomes more nonlinear as, as you increase the, or as, as you deepen the, the neural network. So um, I, uh, I'm not sure, um, or let me say, I do not think this doesn't hold uh, if I take deep networks. But the only way I can, uh, until now, I can guarantee this to hold is by a single layer. So yes, the analysis is, is I would say, completely clear for me for a single layer network. Because, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, this, this uh, I should say, this is a combination of two things, right? One of them is that uh, your network has good approximations, which uh, approximation properties, which has to do with, uh, yeah. Uh, many things, but uh, in particular, we can say for a single layer network, but it also has to do with the PD uh, regularity, the PD solution regularity, right? So you need your your solution to to have some to to let be approxim approximated. So um, that one, uh, I don't feel so. I mean, we know that if the coefficients are good enough. This one, uh, this second uh, condition will will hold anyway. But, okay. Uh, yeah, but for sure, for sure, yes. Uh, if I want to to state uh, this result, right, in in a mathematical uh, theorem, uh, say fashion, I, I'm I'm assuming yes that I have a single layer. Yep. Mm -hmm. And uh, another point that was not uh, fully clear to me. Do you assume your problem, the original problem, to be convex, or uh, your well um, theorem and proof uh, holds or so, to a more general 
class of problems. And so this is the convexity. So the, the thing is that the, this problem will be will be convex, right? This minimization mm -hmm. problem. And yeah. It's more than that. So actually, uh, this is some result. Uh, let me just stop here for a second. Uh, this paper by Kai Lazaro, Montefilm, and Cormick, which has to do with the finite element analysis of this type of formulation. Um, they actually prove that this problem is elliptic. So it's 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 actually more than more than just convex, right? Uh, you actually mm -hmm. have some some uniformity. So right. So, so that's. So, I mean, so, of course, so, B, B cannot be whatever, yeah. right? A and B cannot be whatever. In principle, your approach uh, would encounter some difficulties if the problem, the original original problem, would be. Oh yeah. Non complex yeah, and yeah, yeah, oh, but uh, yeah, that's for sure. I mean, and the problem is the method is not, uh, <laughs> I mean, it's not uh, valid proof. Uh, mm -hmm. So, of course, we, mm -hmm. we, we, need, we need a formulation that, uh, or a new, I mean, we, we can make sense of the method for, for problems that fit well in, in this least squares uh, framework. Mm -hmm. Okay, so but, maybe uh, last, last comment from my side is mm -hmm. uh, when you were mentioning about. A problem with uh, blowing uh, up uh, mm. of the par in the parametric space. So mm. it is uh, mm, the fact that you want to have it bounded. You have this uh, coercitivity mm. uh, property. So I think it is quite a popular technique in the machine learning uh, community to have this weight normalization. Yes. Done. So I think but, this goes along with the idea that you mentioned that you want to keep the norm of the weights. I, uh, yes, but but adding a standard penalization uh, is already uh, also restricting. I mean, you're adding an extra term. You don't know the, how large the optimal parameters are. Mm -hmm. Right? It's not that you don't want them to be too big. Uh, sorry, it's not that you want them to keep them small. You want to avoid them being too big. So adding a penalization would would create some conflict in there. So we try maybe it may try might try to add uh, or to put in too much smoothness in your function in your solution, mm -hmm. which may not be there. So uh, adding just a penalization term, uh, I do not think, or it's not uh, working well enough for us. I see. So it, it's it's it, regularization has to come with a different flavor. Uh, than, than a penalization. Um, you see, uh, just because uh, a priori you don't know how large your parameters have to be, but you still want them, you still want to keep them inside some compact mm -hmm. in order to keep, so uh, to keep your argument. Uh, so yeah, I, I, it's, it's not so clear to me how to, so it's not adding a penalty term. Uh, I think that's what you meant, right? No, it's a, it's called weight normalization. That's why I believe it's a, a class of techniques to um, keep the, uh, the kind of direction of the uh, weight vector constant, but just to control the length of that vector. And then you can, um, yeah compute the scaled solution and only then scale it back to a original uh, or desired uh, okay. Uh, okay. scales or, or units, uh, but mm. normally you only operate on uh, some controlled size of the, of the weight um, vector, yes. uh, meaning the weight, yes, but... per, weight per, per layer. But, yeah, but okay, I, I sh should check it uh, more carefully. But uh, That's how I understand it. Yeah, but my, my, my way to understand it is that, uh, mm -hmm. okay, this normalization may be fine, but then when you scale back, how you, how you keep control on, the, on this rescaling? That's what mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm maybe, maybe so sure. A, this is done by. by yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but thanks, right. thanks for the pointer because uh, uh, I, will, I will check it. So, anyways, from from my side, uh, I, I 
I have some technical, let's say, questions, but I, I think I, I can uh, work out it, work them out by listening to the to your presentation again uh, or reading the paper uh, that uh, is linked to the to the advert advert of your presentation on on the website of the seminar. Uh, so from my side, it is it is all. Uh, I don't know if there is any question from the audience uh, now. Um, Perhaps uh, if there will be any question, somebody can contact you in person okay, after, sure. afterwards. I'd be happy to. Because I cannot see anyone wishing to ask a question now. So thank you again. Uh, okay, thank you for the for the Pantavlo for your time and uh, for sharing with us your approach and your results. Okay, thank have, you. a, have a good day to you and okay. good, good afternoon to, to you, all of us. Uh, and I will keep you posted, posted about uh, future seminars. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Goodbye. You are. It's a pleasure.